Thank you, Connie, for that wonderful introduction. Um, by the way, I was right before this uh, at Evelocity, which is this really cool electric vehicle company in Torrance. And so they need Southern California Edison's help. Um, but um, I was there with my amazing staff, uh, Nico, my district director, and Aurelia, uh, my field representative. And of course, my staff asked the one super important question, uh, which is, hey, are you a member of the Torrance Area Chamber of Commerce? <laughs> Turns out they're not, so you just might want to, you know, say hi to them. All right. Uh, so uh, it's my honor to uh, be here along with the Congresswoman Maxine Waters. And uh, the only reason we're even here today uh, is because we funded government last Friday. So sometimes we, yeah. right. so we set out low expectations of American people, and then sometimes we meet them. Right. So, uh, but I do want to say what an amazing experience it is to be able to work uh, with Maxine Waters. Uh, she's a national treasure. And before she became chair, uh, she was in the minority party. And for a very long time, she kept talking and warning us about the excesses of Wall Street. And had we all listened to her last decade, I'm not sure that this recession that Wall Street caused would have happened. I'm so glad that our colleagues elected her as chair of financial services. She's going to do an amazing job and look out uh, for all Americans. So we should give her a big round of applause. <laughs> and I also uh, recognize uh, her husband, Sydney, and uh, all that you do for public service and having been an ambassador. So thank you for uh, your service to the nation as well. <clears throat> And sitting next to Maxine is the love of my life, uh, my wife, Betty. And as some of you may know, as she was recently elected uh, to the Torrance School Board. <laughs> and I want to recognize um, the Torrance uh, City Mayor, Pat Fury, and his uh, wife, Terry, for their leadership of Torrance, as well as all the Torrance Council members. <laughs> and to my friend Leroy and his staff for all you do for Torrance. I see uh, Superintendent um, George Mannon of the Torrance Unified School District. Thank you for being here. And want to recognize uh, Don Lee on the Torrance School Board and you have um, the very best school board in the nation, just being objective about that. <laughs> And thank you, uh, Donna, for your leadership uh, of the Torrance Chamber, and John uh, for your le leadership as well. So I'm going to uh, touch on three issues. The first will be on uh, what is happening locally. Then I'm going to talk to you about what is happening in Washington, D.C. And then I'm going to conclude on Yemen, because very few people ever talk about Yemen. So in terms of uh, what's happening locally, uh, the first is infrastructure. I was pleased to have worked with uh, Congresswoman Waters and uh, other members on a bipartisan basis to make sure we got full phase one funding uh, for Metro. We will continue to make sure we give Metro the funding that they need to build out light rail and subways in Los Angeles, Southern California. And we're working with Metro to make sure that we take the green line all the way down here to Torrance. And in, a, in addition, um, we were able to stop Metro from putting in a sort of stupid plan that was going to make it for, hard for South Bay folks to access the metro and require more than one stop. So we were able to um, make sure that that didn't happen. In terms of uh, other infrastructure, uh, last term I introduced a bill uh, that would provide $2 trillion of infrastructure funding across America. If you look at uh, the American Society for Civil Engineers report, they say we have a $4 trillion infrastructure deficit. But when I introduced that legislation, even some of my colleagues in my caucus said, oh, that's too expensive. You might have remembered last year when the president gave a State of the Union, he talked about infrastructure, and then he mentioned the figure 1.5 trillion. So I said, see, I wasn't that far off. <laughs> uh, so I think there's an ability uh, to work together and hopefully we can uh, get legislation done on infrastructure. Locally, we also do have a homelessness problem. It is something that affects some cities more than others. Much of this is uh, done at the city and county level. However, there are some members 
uh, who are homeless who happen to be veterans. And so the federal government does have programs uh, to help veterans. Now one is called HUD-VASH, so it will provide uh, the HUD part, which is housing, and then it provides services through the VASH part. So if you uh, know of any veterans uh, who may be homeless or on the verge of uh, becoming homeless, please let Congresswoman Waters or I know and, and we will help them. One of the first bills I got signed into law also uh, revitalized the West LA VA, the largest VA in the nation. It also services uh, uh, Torrance residents. And at its full build out, that will allow uh, the entire campus to have one, over 1,000 units uh, for housing homeless veterans. We were able to get one building uh, opened up and running a few months ago. Uh, we'll plan to get more up and running. And uh, it is an issue that the federal government does actually have resources to, uh, to help homeless veterans. And then, thank you. And then um, in terms of uh, other local issues, I do want to let you know, as some of you may know, I, I grew up in a family business. I um, worked in a family business. I worked actually as a kid in a family business um, because we were free labor. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's very clear to me uh, how important businesses are uh, to uh, not just communities, but to making sure that our e economy continues to uh, grow and prosper. So thank you all for everything that you do uh, in terms of helping the community and helping uh, the economy thrive and prosper here, here in the South Bay. By the way, I have heard, uh, so Congresswoman Waters and I have gone to other events and I um, just want to confirm she's actually never said so-and-so chamber is the best in America. So that's quite a compliment <laughs> to you. Uh, so, yeah. And then the last local issue I'm gonna touch on is I will shortly be introducing legislation. I sit on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and it's pretty clear to me that diplomacy happens at a lot of different levels, not just the federal level. So we have a huge number of exchanges that happen uh, within cities of one country and another country. We have city governments that do exchanges uh, between one country and another country. And so what this legislation will do is provide State Department resources to local cities uh, and counties who want to engage in this kind of outreach. And so hopefully um, we can uh, get that done this term. So in terms of what's happening uh, in the Capitol, I'm not gonna be partisan here, I'm just gonna be descriptive of what happened uh, last November. Uh, uh, so one, one party ran on lowering health care costs, on investing in infrastructure, and on cleaning up corruption in D.C. Uh, the other party ran on building the wall. The American people made a decision in November, and so Democrats now control the House of Representatives, and for the first year, the House of Representatives is going to deliver on those promises that were made. So I'm just gonna to talk to you about some of the legislation uh, that is gonna come out of uh, the first six months. We're gonna pass out HR1, uh, which is a bill uh, that will reform campaign finance laws, uh, get rid of, as much as we can, corruption in DC, and also protect voting rights. So that'll be one of the first bills uh, that we'll send out. We also will pass out HR8, uh, which is background checks uh, for, uh, for guns. It, <laughs> I'm on the House Judiciary Committee. Last week, uh, we passed uh, this legislation out of the committee after 10 hours of debate. It was the first gun legislation in over a decade uh, to pass out of this committee, and we intend to get it off the floor of the House uh, by later this month. It has 97% support among the American public, uh, including many gun owners, and what it essentially does is it closes loopholes in background checks. I call it really violent history checks. That's mostly what these background systems are checking for. So right now, if you were to go to a gun dealer and you want to buy a gun, uh, you would submit your information, they run a background check. In 90% of the cases, it takes about um, a couple minutes and then you'll, you'll get the result. But for some cases, it takes a little bit longer. Right now, there's sort of a three day period. So you could do that and get a gun. Or you could just go to a gun show and buy a gun. No background check, no ID check, nothing, which makes it sort of silly, right? You have an entire system set up and then people can simply do that. Uh, there's additional other loopholes uh, that this uh, bill will close. It is also bipartisan. And so uh, it is our hope uh, that, well, first of all, it will pass the House. It's our hope that the U.S. Senate uh, could also pass it because it does have uh, bipartisan support. 
Another piece of legislation we're going to pass out uh, is the Equality Act. So right now uh, in America, uh, there are still states where you can uh, get fired based on who you love. And what this bill will do is basically take the Civil Rights Act and uh, put in LGBT so that you cannot be discriminated against uh, based on your status. And, and, and we're also going to pass out legislation on reducing health care costs in terms of drugs. If you, uh, so there's two things going on. One is prescription drugs, another is generic drugs. I was on the House Oversight Committee in my first term, and we were seeing these spikes in generic drugs, which makes no sense, right? There is no R&D for generic drugs. None of their arguments that pharmaceutical companies use for drug pricing would actually apply to generic drugs. So we were wondering, how come you're getting these massive spikes in generic drugs, some of which help AIDS victims, cancer victims, uh, and, and, and other folks? So it turned out that because of the way the FDA operated, there was about a seven to eight year delay, backlog, uh, whatever you want to call it, in terms of allowing another manufacturer to make the same generic drug. So some of these companies figured out they can buy a generic drug, and then they would have about seven years where they could charge any price they want and have basically zero competition. And so after uh, we sort of figured that out, uh, we held hearings, we went after the FDA, on a bipartisan basis, and the FDA committed uh, that they would lower that timeline to about eight months. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll see generic drug prices start to drop, and um, it is simply one of those problems that a monopoly was inadvertently created uh, because of what the FDA was doing. And then in terms of prescription drugs, there will be legislation coming out uh, on that as well. Uh, we're also going to be putting out legislation on infrastructure. It's clear that majority of American people want to see something done on infrastructure. So in addition to building roads, bridges, and highways, uh, my view is in the 21st century, we also have to talk about cyber uh, as part of our infrastructure. Uh, it is not good that we've had dams in the United States that have been hacked, right? That's not a good thing. Uh, so we need to protect our critical assets in terms of cybersecurity, and then we have to make sure we get rural broadband everywhere uh, in America. So I think uh, that will be uh, pretty significant piece of legislation. Because it is really big, and there's lots of moving parts, that's going to take a little while longer before it comes out. And in terms of um, one other piece of legislation on cyber, last December I was very pleased that one of the bills that I introduced, along with Republican Senators Hassan and Portman, uh, was one that made sure that the cybersecurity at our Depar Department of Homeland Security uh, was robust and upgraded, and it did this interesting thing, which is it allowed a program to have DHS go and hire white hat hackers to hack itself, uh, to find out uh, its uh, vulnerabilities. So the Pentagon started this program, it worked well, and as elected officials here know, uh, one of the best things you can do is copy what other thing places have done. So we basically took that model and said, DHS, you're going to do uh, the same thing now. And I'm very pleased that the President signed that into law. And now I have additional legislation that does it uh, to the State Department uh, as well. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the national emergency that uh, many of you are aware of uh, declared on Friday. So I'm just going to give you some facts. Be up to you what you want to do with these facts. So these are undisputable facts uh, because these facts come from the Trump administration. Based on statistics from the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, border apprehensions, which is basically a proxy for how many people actually cross the border, have decreased 75 percent from 2000 to 2018. That's just a fact. Based on the latest data from the FBI, we know that violent crime is down across the United States. We also know that property crime is down across the United States. And then, um, based on data from the Department of Homeland Security, we know that in terms of illegal drugs, 80 to 90 percent of it goes through legal checkpoints, legal por ports of entry. So those are what the facts are. And if what the president wants to do is to redirect funds to then build a wall between ports of entry, it's not clear that any of that uh, has anything to do with 
the facts I just laid out, right? If you really want to stop the flow of illegal drugs, you would upgrade ports of entry. You would make sure they had the technology to scan vehicles much better. We'll give them much more drug detection dogs. We can do all sorts of things to make sure that we do more at our ports of entry to stop the flow of illegal drugs. If you also look at what the president wants to do in terms of redirecting funds, one is he would take billions from the Department of Defense Drug and Addiction Program. Really sort of stupid, right? If your goal is to stop illegal drugs and then take from that program to take a long time to build a wall that doesn't even really apply to ports of entry. So that's just sort of on the facts. Um, by the way, study after study also shows that immigrants, both documented and undocumented, commit less crimes than they are born Americans on a per capita basis, on a proportional basis. However you slice it, immigrants commit less crime. So those are what the facts are. And you have a lawsuit now, you're probably going to have several lawsuits that occur. Um, one of the great things about our judicial branch uh, is they operate based on facts. And it's, we feel pretty confident uh, that we will win these lawsuits. And one reason uh, is if you just sort of see the timing of this, if this administration thought that this was a winning strategy, they would have declared a national emergency on day one, or six months into it, or a year into it. They wouldn't have waited over two years, then additional 35 days, uh, and then a little bit more before they did this. So we feel pretty good just based on the facts. And then I'm just going to talk to you about the law of this. <clears throat> so what happened was that Congress, on a bipartisan basis, right, funded government last week and specifically rejected the president's demand for $5.6 billion for a border wall. He got 1.375. If you look at the way the law is written, uh, there is no way you can say that Congress intended to allow this statute on national emergencies to now let the president do an end run based on what Congress just did on bipartisan basis last week. So the courts would have to sort of say, well, Congress didn't intend to give him this money, but because of this other law Congress passed decades ago,